If you are really close, uh, it can be upward in that range of close to 100 decibels, which is going to be right next to a lawnmower, motorcycle, or something. Well, if you live on the East Coast or in the Midwest, or if you can hear in the background the rumbling of cicadas, it's cicada season. I'm pleased to introduce Professor PJ Leash. He's an extension entomologist and the director of Insect Diagnostic Lab at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Go Badgers. I'm also a Badger. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Charlie. Well, for you, this must be the super bug bowl, right? I mean, You've got these two broods that have come together, billions of cicadas. How long have you been tracking this and how long have you been waiting for this to happen? Oh, that's a, a really interesting question. So I turn 40 next year. This year was the first time I've ever seen these with my own eyes. You could say I've been waiting 39 years, I suppose, to see them. Uh, I knew they were coming this year, had quite a while to prepare for it, but it has been uh, exciting because... I've been telling folks it's like that total solar eclipse we had earlier this year. How many times in your life do you get the opportunity to witness something like that, an amazing natural phenomenon? Well, that's 17 years, but this is quite special because there's two broods. The 13 year and the 17 year have come up out of the ground at the same time. Is that like when was the last time that happened? Oh, 221 years ago. So 1803, Thomas Jefferson was president. The Louisiana Purchase was a new thing in our country's history. It's not going to happen again for another 221 years. So that gets us to what, 2245? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I'll, I, I don't think I'll be around. So yeah. explain to me, like, what in numbers? What is going on? Like, give me their life cycle. What seriously? What the heck is going on? Most of their life cycle, we're talking, you know, 98, 99 percent of their life cycle is spent below ground, uh, usually in the upper two feet or so of soil, where they're feeding on plant roots, generally tree roots. Um, and over the course of that time period, they are feeding, they are growing and developing. And then once they get to that final year, either 13 or 17 years, depending on the type and where they're located, then they get to come out as adults. And during that time, they are just partying like crazy making a lot of noise. They are mating to, uh, you know, perpetuate their species. And then they're done and gone for another 13 or 17 years. I assume the males are making the cacophony of all the noise to attract the females. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. The males possess these special membrane like structures on the side of their body called a timbal. And there's little muscles attached to those that can contract and vibrate very, very rapidly. And then also, this is kind of odd sounding, but the, the males have abdomens that are essentially hollow. So you got this air chamber that plays a role with the vibrations to produce the sound. So these things have essentially evolved to be living musical instruments to make that really loud sound and then use that to attract the females. It all sounds the same to me. What is What is the female listening for? Is there some sort of line that works better than others or all the calls can kind of blur together you just get this background noise and, and you'll stand amongst this and you really can't pick out where they are there's just so many of them calling at the same time but if you do happen to be cl in close enough proximity to a given male and it sings you can pick out that individual song so if you can imagine if this is going on say up in the canopy of trees you got males that are singing. If a female's nearby and she's receptive, what she'll do to say, hey, I'm interested, she'll take her wings and kind of rub them or flick them against each other, making like a little bit of a snapping noise. And then the male can change his call a little bit. So you get a little bit of back and forth. They get closer. They go about their business to make more cicadas. Uh, but that's generally how it works. And then the noise, right? It's been described as louder than 100 to 120 decibels, that's loud. If you are really close, uh, it can be upward in that range of close to 100 decibels, which is going to be like being right next to a, like a lawnmower, motorcycle or something. That's not something you want to be around for long periods of time for the sake of your hearing. So the female does her dance and then they mate, right? They do the deed. Yeah. And then she begins to lay eggs? Yes. Yeah, so af after mating, the females are going to go to trees or shrubs. Uh, and the female has an egg laying device called an ovipositor. And she'll take the structure and she can use that to slice into these twigs. 
Uh, she then inserts a batch of eggs into those slits. The eggs are gonna sit there for about a month and a half to maybe close to two months before they hatch. The young, very young juveniles then hatch out of the eggs. They drop down to the ground and then they burrow into the ground and that's where they're gonna spend the bulk of their lifetime. Explain to me also just the, the importance of temperature. Right, They come out of the ground at a certain temperature. They only sing at a certain temperature. Is that accurate? Describe that to me. And then also, you know, as we think about the effects of possible global warming, how does that change the game, if at all? Oh, that's really interesting question to think about the, the climate change aspect. Um, temperature definitely is a, a key factor. And this is really true of, of pretty much any insect uh, because insects in a nutshell are cold blooded creatures. And so if it's cold out, it just slows down their physiology. And if it's too cold, they're lethargic, can't do anything. Uh, if it's really cold, it can actually kill them outright in some cases. Uh, so in general, it's kind of like baking a cake. The warmer it is, the faster things go, you know, up to a certain limit. If it's too hot, it's, it's certainly bad for them as well. When it gets up to about 64 degrees at that eight inch depth, that kind of sets the stage. And then another thing that helps them is if you get a good, decent rainfall at that time, that really gets them to start popping out. Uh, and then temperature plays a, a role just with their everyday lives and activity. If it's a cool, rainy day, they're just not gonna be active. But if you had a, a hot or warm, sunny day, it's in the mid to high 70s or in the 80s, they're gonna be very active and very loud under those conditions. And then as far as timing, I know they don't have watches, but how, how are they so specifically exact that they know 17 years or 13 years, whatever their timing is, that they're going to reemerge? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And it's a really deep topic. And for part of it, we don't fully understand. We do know they have some sort of, of way or, or method of counting things. And that has to do with uh, changes in chemicals within plants. So if these things are in the soil, uh, with needle-like mouthparts basically sipping sap out of tree ruts. We know trees change throughout the course of the season. So in spring, sap's going upwards. Uh, in fall, you know, nutrients are getting shunted down to the roots so they can be stored. The leaves fall off the trees. And to a cicada, they'd be able to basically taste or detect changes in this or changes in the chemicals. And so that is a way that they can keep track. You had one a cycle of these changes within the tree, that's one year and so on. Interestingly, there's been a little bit of research in this and this ties into something you mentioned a minute ago, Charlie, about climate change and, and what that might mean for this. Well, if we end up getting more variability and fluctuations in temperature, uh, I mean, in the upper Midwest, we had a pretty early spring this year in Wisconsin uh, in Northern Illinois. And so if we have a condition like that again, but then maybe it dumps a bunch of snow in late March and April, the trees thinks it, it's winter again, they lose leaves, that would affect the uh, cicadas uh, most likely. And so that might screw up some of their ability to count with these long life cycles. Uh, instead of 17 years, you might start getting 16, 15, and, and so on. Um, and that might screw things up a little bit on their end. In your life, right? What do bugs teach you? Like, what have you learned from them that you sort of adopted in your life? Yeah, oh, that's a deep question. Um, I would say there's little lessons that um, I've learned from all sorts of, of insects. Um, one thing that probably comes to mind first would be how you to be resourceful. Um, because wherever you look, uh, there are insects taking advantage of just about any resource on the planet. Some of these we we take for granted and, and folks might have kind of a, you know, an ew viewpoint of them, things like dumb beetles, but these insects are very good at finding their little niches and becoming very, very good at what, uh, what they do. Um, you know, when we see survival movies like The Road and, and the theater, stuff like that, you know, there's hardly any food to go around in those kind of post-apocalyptic movies. And I'm thinking, you just got to start cutting into some logs. There's going to be all sorts of grubs and, and bugs in there. So I, I think being resourceful is probably one of the best things I've learned from them. Awesome. And speaking of food, I know you study them, but have you tasted the cicada? I have. What, what does the cicada taste like? And if you say chicken, that's fine because everyone says that. No, I, A little I sweeter? 
Um, no, I would say a little bit, a little bit savory, a little bit nutty. I mean, you mostly just notice the crunch in my mind. I just have one more sort of out of left field question. Do you, you know, we've, we've obviously heard of bird flu, obviously of mosquitoes with malaria. Is there, um, any sort of thing that people are in their worst nightmares are thinking about transmission of disease by bugs. Is there sort of that, oh boy, I really hope that never happens. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, some of the bigger concerns that come to mind, and, and this ties in with climate change, but we have many mosquito species that are, are maybe more limited to kind of a tropical subtropical distribution. And if with climate change, we have milder winters, are those going to start pushing their way north into the U.S.? Um, there are some that we've maybe picked up just a few times here in the upper Midwest in Wisconsin. But, you know, 50 years down the road, are they going to become regular players? These are some species that are associated with things like dengue fever, yellow fever, Zika virus, and, and so on. Um, and so that can be a little bit scary to think about as well. Uh, another thing that is really relevant uh, up here in Wisconsin and the, the Midwest as a whole would be the deer tick situation with Lyme disease. Um, and uh, it's fascinating to me because in Wisconsin, we didn't detect our first deer tick or document it until about the late 1960s. And now they can be found in essentially every county in the state. So these things are still expanding their range. When are they going to stop? Are they just going to keep expanding to the point that they are a common occurrence in everyday yards? If they are, that's going to be a, a really significant health threat because of the diseases they carry like Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and there's some other ones they can carry too that you just don't want to mess with. I just want to ask you this. So I've raised my family in a two-story home and I always, we never used insecticide. We let the spiders live on the first floor, but if they got to the second floor, they were, we would kill them. So I just want you to pause it. Like it's good to have spiders, right? Spiders are useful. Was I just telling my kids wrong things? No, no, they, they certainly are useful. And for the most part, spiders are really quite harmless. Um, if you were to ask an arachnologist, this is someone who specifically specializes in studying spiders. You know, most arachnologists will study spiders for decades and decades and never be bitten by them, despite handling them on a probably pretty regular basis. And so there's a lot of myths that really still need further busting about spiders. They're really quite harmless, beneficial creatures, unlikely to bite. You know, everyone has their own impression about spiders and other insects, um, and, and some of it's social and cultural and things like that. So I, I think it's perfectly appropriate to to kind of let them live in your house. And yeah, you know, maybe there's some rooms at your house, you just draw the line in the sand, so to speak, and you, you catch yeah, they, those or do whatever, put them outside. And, and they, nev they never seem to get the message to stay on the first floor, <laughs> right? They just, they didn't, it didn't, it didn't resonate with them. Anything else you'd like to add? I so appreciate your time today. Sure. Well, it, it has been great to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. If, if any listeners would like to connect, I'm pretty active on Twitter as at Wisconsin Bug Guy. Otherwise, if you did a Google search for UW or Wisconsin Insect Diagnostic Lab, you should be able to track me down. And like I said before, go Badgers. Great work coming out of the University of Wisconsin. As always, in full disclosure, I too am a Badger, so I might be biased. So thank you again, PJ. We appreciate it. We hope you come back. Thanks.